Good afternoon. My name is Chang Bum Kim of Huang Access Laboratory, and this is the beam charge, current uh, beam charge and current monitors session. Let me invite uh, the first speaker, uh, Plamen Potachikov, to the stage, please. Plamen Potachikov obtained his PhD in nuclear physics from the University of Notre Dame, United States, in 2005. Since 2013, he is a member of Beam Instrument and Diagnostic Group at GSI, where he is responsible for beam counting and loss monitor detectors of the GS Affair GSI facility. Please start your presentation. Can you hear me? Okay. Okay. So, what I want to tell you now is about uh, the novel fast in radiation heart scintillator detectors we've developed for heavy ions. Now, what I mean with novel is that we were the first one who decided to put the particular scintillator material, zinc oxide, in uh, the beam delivered from our cis accelerator. And now, to explain you now what I mean with fast in radiation heart, I need to tell you just a bit about uh, the use case of scintillators at uh, GSI, which is one of the use cases. Um, then I'll go quickly into the properties of uh, this material, the response to heavy ions, which you will care if this turns out to be something useful for uh, your application, and then show you how actually we built a real operational detector with uh, this uh, material. So now, what we are after is uh, detecting relativistic ions starting from protons up to uranium, and we're looking at something like 250 MeV per nucleon up to the maximum energies which will be delivered from uh, FAIR. Um, the way we use scintillators is uh, we just take a large piece of a plastic scintillator, something like 70 by 70 millimeters, and put it into the beam. Uh, look at the light from individual ions hitting uh, the scintillator. Why do we do this? Well, the signal is extremely clean. You see an example of the signal here. So it's extremely easy to differentiate. We can count individual ions. And where this matters is we use it for the calibration of our intensity measurement devices, um, which we'll show you in a minute. But just a few things to keep in mind. Um, typical width of this pulses is about uh, five nanoseconds if you look right after the detector. And this, of course, matters how fast you can count, how many particles you can count. And if it happens that you cannot put electronics nearby, we can go further away. We have to go further away. And then, of course, uh, the signal is broader. An example here is shown about something 25 nanoseconds after a 50 meter cable, which was used in this case. So, as I indicated, the first application, we have uh, stacks of detectors, scintillator, ionization chamber, SEM, which cover uh, different uh, ranges of uh, counting rates. And uh, here is just an uh, example of our schematics. And the important part is they, have, uh, they are built in such a way that they have overlap in their counting rates. So eventually everything can be tied to the scintillators, where we have no question about uh, uh, the beam intensity, as we see every ion individually. The other application, uh, here by the way, we just care about counting by something 10 to the 5 particles per second. The other application, which is a bit more demanding in counting rates, is uh, spill structure analysis. Um, Zhang Yan showed you uh, something we can do on, in this area yesterday in her paper. The point is there we go as high as possible. Typically, we used up to 10 to 6 particles uh, in this study, but we would like to go even higher, 10 to the 7, because then other beam instrumentation devices come into play. We can measure with our BPMs, and uh, we get with a pretty decent resolution. So what is nice about scintillators is that uh, we do not need to calibrate. We're just counting. That's a threshold, easy thing. Uh, we're using um, PMTs to read them out. This means we have DC coupling, so we don't have to worry about the offset of the, beam line, um, of the, of the baseline as we're going higher and higher in counting rate. Now, another nice thing is actually we have a huge dynamic range. Now we are able actually to count with the same detector, one millimeter scintillator, from protons up to uranium into the uh, energy range which is specified uh, before. Furthermore, um, actually the actual PMT and active voltage divider combination, we can even push easily to a few times 10 to the seven. 
But of course, the limit comes from the width of the pulse. And just to indicate the time scales we're talking here, um, I showed you if you have a, pulse, a normal distribution of uh, pulses uh, on the y-axis, uh, you see the number of uh, particles we lose due to pi up. So overlapping particles, uh, we cannot. We have to do something to differentiate them versus the counting rate. And you see, okay, you have 10 to the 7 uh, counting rate, then we have something like 5% loss. You go 25 uh, nanosecond wide pass, which is what happens after a longer cable, then, okay, we have to do something about it. And actually, you see uh, some of the strategies we're using in what uh, Sam, Sam uh, showed you uh, this poster session. But won't it be nice if we don't have to do this? Well. In other words, wouldn't it be nice if our pulses are really, really fast or short? Uh, the other much more painful thing with these detectors is that uh, well, they are not radiation hard. Um, so after maybe eight hours of uh, experiments uh, for microspeel structure or other uses, one has to change them, which comes really a motivating factor after working in the radiation hard environment and hard to get bases uh, for a while. And this is where zinc oxide comes into the game. Here, I just want to flash you the uh, paper showing the discovery of uh, uh, zinc oxide. Don't worry about reading the text. I will guide you uh, the important bold words. So first thing is it's a scintillator, and it scintillates it from temperature. Then next thing is that to make it scintillate, you need to do something, meaning you have to add some doping. You have to do, add some indium, gallium, in certain uh, amounts. Then optionally, you can put it in uh, uh, hydrogen. Uh, what this does is it releases uh, zinc in the material, making some, uh, taking care of some defects. But the important part from instrumentation is that um, it is uh, emitting blue light very close to the absorption line. In other words, absorption, self-absorption. In other words, if you make it too thick, nothing will come out from deep into your detector, from the deep in your detector material. Then next thing is it's fast. Yeah, then uh, at this point it was clear that it is uh, really fast. You see 10 to minus uh, 9 seconds. A few more things uh, from the paper, uh, how they were excited, or he was exciting. Scintillation, he had UV light hitting the detector material, which was powder in this case, x-rays, and of course you can do it with electrons. So I'm just telling you that out of the box, this is a pretty good detector for this purpose, and it's very fast. Um, the other thing is uh, that one has to be careful is that zinc oxide itself, it has natural luminescence, but it's very slow, it gets in the green. You'll see a bit more a bit later about that. So, just wanted to say there is a huge activity in developing various detectors uh, in this area, plus other applications, because this turns out to be a very useful material um, in general. But what was a big breakthrough was in uh, 2012, when uh, this group here was able to make actually a thick detector thick enough to be used as a gamma detector. Here I'm showing the spectra from cesium iodide, uh, uh, this is number two, and uh, uh, zinc oxide when you are looking at the cesium source, 137. And here now is a picture up there of uh, the material in question. Um, now, why is this picture such a big deal? Usually, I mean, the zinc oxide is white powder, and usually when you make a detector out of it, as I indicated, there is a problem of self-absorption. In fact, you can look into the proxy vision stand and see an example of such a detector. Here, you can actually see through the crystal, or through the piece. So it is transparent, not only actually turns out for visual light, but for the uh, light of interest. This is 0.4 millimeter thick piece, uh, about a uh, disc of 23 millimeters thick. Uh, just for fun, I've put you the recipe how you uh, get this. Um, the key thing is that uh, you're putting powder and you're pressing it at high temperature and uh, pressure. Uh, so you have, in a way, a nanomaterial. If there's time, I'll show you a picture of this. Um, so we had the idea, let's put in the ion beam and see what happens. And it worked actually so successful that uh, we made a cooperation, quite a big cooperation between technologists, material scientists, uh, uh, solid state uh, people, and uh, beam diagnostics people. I highlighted uh, different leaders of these uh, packages. Uh, on the side, on the right hand side, I added uh, the people who I think were instrumental at uh, the development uh, uh, from the beam instrumentation. And especially I wanted to highlight it, Maxim Sofiolin. Uh, my PhD student, without which I think that we will not have an actual working detector uh, in operation, already for operation. So, 
what we are doing is uh, we're characterizing the variety of samples with uh, heavy ions. Uh, we were using argon up to uranium, different energies. In some cases, uh, we'll show you we're able, we had to go to lower energies uh, to be able to uh, go to higher foxes. In other words, we're not having enough particles to damage the material, so we had to go to Uniwak, our linear accelerator, and do our best. Um, just a quick uh, uh, flash of, uh, of uh, one of the setups we're using. The important part I want to say is that we have beam coming from CIS, and then we have a collimator. We collimate the beam down, uh, or we cut the beam down to five millimeter beam spot. So in all the studies later on, this kind of our um, resolution when we're scanning for the materials. And then we have variety of uh, detectors, photomultipliers, uh, spectrometers. Um, here now is the spectrum in the insert of the pure zinc oxide powder. So you see the two bands which I was telling about. Around 400 nanometers, the fast uh, decay, and the green band, this big bump there. Uh, you start doping, you do the treatment, the big bump is done, it's gone. You have to optimize this, of course. Um, so this is the starting point of the study. And uh, now I want to show you now the response uh, to heavy ions. So the picture to the left, this was uh, excited with X-rays. To the right, now we are exciting with heavy ions, relativistic ions. Now, just a few important features here you see. We see uh, that as we are increasing the flux, this is on the, um, one of the axes you see, the, we're damaging the material. The, the light coming from the fast decay is uh, reducing. But the green band does not come back. So it is staying fast scintillator, you see in a bit, as we are damaging. And it's quite high foxes. Um, then it emits uh, at, uh, point four, at 400 nanometers. Or, or point. So it's perfect match for a, a Baokai uh, multiplier. Uh, so this is a replacement, one-to-one -one replacement to PC400. Now, let's now look into uh, the response of this material. So whenever I say PC400, the comparison is to one millimeter thick uh, PC400. So you can scale to your user case if you have the data, or there are, of course, a lot of models which describe the response of the scintillator. So, first thing kind of to remember, rule of thumb, the uh, light output from uh, uh, BC400 compared to zinc oxide, roughly factor of two difference. So, overall output, factor of two. And uh, it varies quite a, uh, from sample to sample, of course. And this is shown here, it's a signal from photomultiplier, uh, correct over a number of uh, ions. Second thing, we have a large data set, so now we can see how the signal of uh, uh, the detector changes over the variety of energies and species. And it is, you see, it's this, this factor of one half is staying there roughly. So in other words, it is the same physics as uh, guides the change of the signal of uh, a plastic scintillator in BC400. Or from practical point of view, you know what you get if you have to happen already the data. Or you can just uh, set, use a model. Next, how fast it is. Now here with a dotted line is a BC400 uh, signal. With uh, the continuous line is the zinc oxide. Uh, here we have the response of the uh, detector system in. So we have a reasonably fast photomultiplier, fast based on a nanosecond we want to, uh, resolution, we want, not resolution, half if you want to uh, obtain eventually. And then uh, to gigahertz scope. So my message is that it is extremely fast or for us now, pile up is not an issue anymore. And if you decide to use time of uh, flight measurements, well, here you just put the uh, numbers, and from here, it depends on your electronics. Again, you can start estimating what you can get. But it's, as I said, extremely fast. Next point, how about the radiation hardness? So now, here I have, again, amplitude uh, of the signal from a photomultiplier versus a dose. So how to interpret this? Let's look only on uranium. These are the, the black dots there. Um, so the dose is ready to the FOX, which is the number of ions which this integrator got, and then this measures the lifetime. So higher FOX, longer lifetime. Uh, the coefficient of uh, proportionality is related to the energy loss. So uh, just to get an idea, the energy loss uh, into BC400 is uh, about 50% less than the energy loss, not energy loss, of, uh, into zinc oxide for uranium. So now, of course, it's not a cutoff state point when you say, I can have to change my detector. Uh, you change a BC400 when you have a dose of something like 50, 100 uh, kilogray. And you see here with all this, we are, let's say, can easily go maybe two orders of magnitude more in terms of operation time. So it's a radiation card. Furthermore, 
Uh, just to show you here the distributions, because you can say, okay, you're saying we, you're showing us uh, the mean, but of course the distribution uh, uh, being changed of the signals. Uh, just show you the distribution is easy to discriminate. You can always put a water threshold of 25 millivolts. It will be easy to see all the signals up to these huge fluxes. But what I wanted to now stress it with better news is that we can anneal it. So here you can see a picture of a damaged uh, uh, scintillator. We see the, hope you can see the beam spot. And after putting it in air for a short time, the spot is gone. Now, in the graphs underneath it, you see what happens with the scintillation white if excited with X-rays. Uh, number one is just a spot uh, taken out of the damage area. Uh, two is the damage area. After kneading, you get number three. But this, of course, on the surface. So we worked with heavy ions, so from the bulk of the material. And indeed, we have recovered material. And even more, I mean, sometimes you have a kneading of a material, but then uh, the radiation damage comes in much faster in this region. It's not the case for zinc oxide. So we have recovered the properties, at least once. And I don't know how many, we have to study how many times you can do this cycle, but okay. Now, wouldn't it be nice if we were able to predict how the radiation damage evolves? Um, in, in other words, we have so many energies, so many uh, species, would like to have an idea of when we have to think about changing detectors, or depending on your case, how long the detector will last in your conditions. And uh, for this, we had to go to uh, the linear accelerator. We have a GSI, UNIWAC. Um, the reason is that there, in a shorter time, we can get bigger dose. What I was showing you before is what we could do our best within the time, <laughs> with a reasonable experimental time at uh, SIS. So, um, concentrate on uh, the upper curve with um, closed uh, circle, this is with uh, calcium. So we have uh, the energy of calcium is directed in such a way that the energy loss per nanometer is the same as for uranium. So we have uh, lower energy, and actually here it's even more damaging, we're stopping the material. Uh, anyway, the point is that we're able to go an, go an order of magnitude higher in the terms of fluxes uh, we can study. Uh, the Y curve uh, axis is uh, the integral of number of photons taken with a spectrometer from uh, the fast component. I mean, this whole component is not there, but to have a clear signal, we select the fast component. The point is that it follows uh, uh, brick Bragg's uh, uh, law. So the discovery is that, yes, it follows uh, this uh, relation. Uh, there, empirically, there are two parameters you fit. Uh, this is the initial intensity I not and phi one half. In phi one half, we have the physics, the damage cross section, and so forth. But the important point is that if you now plot uh, phi one half uh, versus uh, the energy deposited, uh, into the material. You see this correlation, it is uh, the blue points. Uh, for reference, uh, there is the literature values uh, um, uh, from uh, BC400. Uh, so this is the discovery of uh, one of the discoveries uh, we have. And uh, this is what Maxim showed uh, in uh, his paper yesterday. So we can predict uh, the damage too. So um, now, I wanted to show you this other gotcha point one has to be careful with this material, which is the self-absorption. Um, here you can see um, on the right uh, the transmission through the material as a function of wavelength. Okay, there are a few different curves as it evolves into those. And on uh, with the dotted um, line, you can see uh, the signal from the fast uh, decaying component of uh, zinc oxide. So you see, you have to be careful how thick you make it, in other words, because you may eventually lose your signal. Um, another interesting point uh, to keep in mind is, uh, okay, so is that um, it is uh, a diffuse scatter. The reason it's diffuse scatter is the way it is uh, built. Here is a micros uh, electron microscopy uh, picture, so you can see we have a lot of grains which were pushed together. Um, but from a practical point of view, uh, what I think is important to know, to keep in mind, is that if you wanted to put a detector on the side of, it, uh, of, of your crystal or, or, or a ceramics, you see practically nothing if the beam is uh, hitting the middle because most of the light uh, or photons will be absorbed. So what you want to do is you want to see uh, collect the light uh, from the large surface there, um, and. 
we did this. What we took is uh, we've cut out rectangular pieces uh, out of uh, these circles. But the problem is that uh, for operational reasons, we would like to have a large detector of order this 70 uh, uh, by 70 millimeters. So we had to figure out how to tile them in order to pull the detector out of many, many of these pieces. Um, Conceptually, uh, this is how we did this. So we have, uh, with green uh, zinc oxide pieces put together, then behind it uh, we put uh, radiation hard glass, the thickness and roughness of which were optimized uh, so we can capture as much light as possible. Um, but of course, if you put mechanic like tiles together, I mean, you have gaps between. So you'll be missing some particles which just happen to be going through just the gap between the two tiles. So the way you solve this is just put two layers one on one side of uh, the glass, one on behind, but you shift them a bit. I mean, we are after counting, so uh, if uh, the, the, this, the particle goes in a gap from in front, well, we'll hit a, a tower behind, so it'll give us a big enough signal, hopefully, uh, to see it and count it. And then, okay, then you have a plastic scintillator going to a, a photomultiplier. And this is how this looks in reality. Uh, the right side is showing the tiles uh, together. On the left-hand side, you have them already covered with uh, Teflon and uh, black tape uh, ready for installation. And we characterize the detector with beam, and it worked perfectly. So uh, what I'm showing you here is what we call counting efficiency. So we have um, two detectors, uh, the detector in question and uh, the plastic scintillator, which is a bit larger behind, and we're shooting through. And we see, walk into the uh, counts, one versus the other. So 100% means that same number of particles count in both detectors with this five millimeter beam scanning all around the detector, and you see the result of a scan. Uh, on the side, uh, it's a different color. It's uh, less counting efficiency, and the reason is because our zinc oxide detector is a bit smaller than uh, the BC400. So Eventually, some beam hits the BC400, but uh, does not uh, uh, hit uh, the zinc oxide. OK, so now let me summarize. So now I understand what you mean, I mean with fast and radiation hard. I showed you that we can anneal these detectors. Um, then now you, you have, I think, hopefully enough information for the response of the material and see if this is something of interest for you. And I showed you how we can build large detectors. I mean, we did uh, uh, 45 by 45, but this was not a fundamental stop. It was just a demonstration. So actually, later in there, we have to go to something like uh, 100 uh, by 100 millimeters. So now, where do we go from here? Um, um, uh, just if we wanted, for instance, to look into uh, minimum ionizing particles protons, for instance. They use the same idea of stacking many uh, zinc uh, oxide tile followed by uh, a white guide to a photomultiplier. Why would you do this? Well, if you wanted to do uh, to put a um, BMOS monitor in a hard-to-get place due to radiation constraints, or you wanted to send it to space, it's something to consider. Uh, another application which you're looking into is uh, uh, screens. Um, the point is that uh, based on uh, the result of our colleagues from Excel, uh, we know that uh, we can estimate when we expect to have saturation in our chromox screens. Um, these are screens, again, uh, we have all around uh, the high energy beam transport lines and we rely for uh, a daily operation. Um, so the, the point is that, um, okay, you do your scaling, we expect to see the saturation effects at around six times 10 to the nine particles uh, of uranium, uh, focused to 10 millimeters. Uh, at there, we'll be going to something like 10 to the 11, at least, and we'll have a, a place where we have tighter focusing. So we expect to see this. Well, zinc oxide is an interesting material because uh, the decay time, which I showed you, is faster, much faster than the extraction when we are running uh, in, in, in fast extraction. I mean, this is where you get this uh, saturation. Um, this is the first step. Uh, uh, we walked into the white yield of uh, zinc oxide uh, versus our chromox, standard chromox. Um, it's about uh, 10 times uh, more white from zinc oxide, well, it's standard chromox because chromox properties vary quite a bit from manufacturer to manufacturer. Um, so. With this, I would like to thank you uh, for your interest and attention. And I wanted just to highlight again uh, a few different people who may be a starting point if this is something interesting for you to contact or if you want to discuss. Uh, of course, I'm always open because uh, 
I made it kind of a simple, broad overview, but of course the devil is in the details, which are not presented, can be presented in such a short time. Um, yeah, and I would like to thank the organizing committee for inviting me here to show you this development. Thank you. Thank you very much for the nice presentation. Now the floor is open for the question and comments, please. Hi, uh, thank you for your talk. I'm over here. <laughs> um, when you say it's 10 times brighter, do you mean the peak intensity or the integrated intensity? Integrated intensity. So what, I did, what we did is um, uh, we had a camera, same camera, looking at uh, uh, the uh, two samples. We we're moving them uh, one after another in the beam and yeah, compare total uh, integrated intensity. But this is from this narrow peak, which I showed you. Okay. I mean, in zinc oxide, okay, it's chromo says integrated, everything, yes. Right. And do you expect uh, the radiation damage? How fast does the luminescence decay? Uh, this actually, um, go back. You had, you had it there. It, it's it's foamy brick wall. It's this okay. fit here. This is, uh, again, a uh, total uh, number of uh, photons coming out uh, from the fast uh, decay. So from here, you can estimate it. Uh, Mm -hmm. Here, so yeah, so you can just, uh, and depending on, you have to scale for your energy deposition and so forth, and then you can just calculate it. It's the same, then. yeah. Thanks. And any other question? Uh, thank you very much for the nice overview. Um, is this material commercially available in scintillating units, or? So. Um, as I was trying to indicate, there is huge activity into this in different areas. Um, the, um, it it, it depends what you need now. So if you're to uh, use X-rays and alpha uh, detection uh, or electron detection, uh, I guess proxy vision is there for you. And, and, and it, there are many groups in material science uh, who are looking into uh, this too. Uh, so, uh, that's one thing. Now, second is, what is it that if you want to look at gammas, then uh, you want to have uh, thicker material of something like, uh, okay, let me go back. If, if you care about seeing a light from a few micrometers, you can buy this. If you care about uh, seeing light uh, from a thicker material, then this is uh, more of a research uh, um, topic. The material we have here, this is, uh, produces a part of a research uh, from an institute in Russia. And they have um, a company associated with them. So if it was not uh, for the current constraints, I can tell you, go ahead and buy it from them. And, but so maybe in not so long future when all this is sorted out, uh, you can buy the 0.4 millimeters. And if you want a thinner one, you can buy it. I think you can go and order it now. Okay, thank you. Any more questions? Uh, I have one. So you just mentioned about annealing process, and did you try several times, I mean, this kind of annealing process? No, no, this was done only once. Um, yeah. I see, I see. Mm -hmm. Okay, if there's no question. But just to, I was speaking, like, to understand, like, it will be, like, now as I'm saying, a scintillator, BC400, it lasts maybe eight hours. Now, with 100 times, we'll be walking into years. So we're talking now, if we have the same user case, maybe four years. So if we knew it eight years, so even once, if it is reproducible, which we think it should be, it's quite, um, yeah. I see. Thank you. Thank you. Let's thanks again to the speaker. Okay, let's invite, uh, let me invite the second speaker, uh, Pere, um, Perugini Casolano. Perugini Casolano received his PhD in physics from the University of Naples, uh, Federico II, in 2019. After that, he works on beam monitoring for the radiation hardness assurance in, at INFN. 
He currently works as a postdoc at the University of Bern, 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 I'm sorry, on the development of new detector for flash radiation therapy. Please. Thanks. Uh, uh, good afternoon, uh, everybody. Thank you for the introduction, and uh, thanks to the committee for uh, this opportunity. So this is the outline of uh, my presentation. So first of all, I, I'm going to talk about the, the flash therapy, so the ultra-high dose rate radiation therapy, which is, uh, let's say, around uh, in the last few years. It's a very promising modality. And then after that, I will focus the attention on the development of uh, new detectors uh, for flash therapy that we are doing at the University of Bern. And then uh, I will discuss uh, the results uh, uh, with protons, but actually also with, with electron beams. This is something quite, recently, quite recent because a uh, few weeks ago we were at the CLEAR facility at CERN for testing these devices. Uh, and so also I would like to add in this presentation uh, the results. And then finally, I try to trace some uh, conclusion. So let's start with the flash therapy. Okay, in the last uh, few years, so from 2015, there was the, this first observation of the flash effect. What is the flash effect? So basically they have seen, so radiobiologists basically, uh, that uh, ultra high dose rate have a sparing effect on healthy tissue. Uh, what does it mean? So basically uh, when 40, greater than 40 gray per second are delivered in less than 300 milliseconds. So you can imagine that this beam is delivered really quickly and the dose rate is very high uh, to, to the tumor compared to the conventional radiotherapy, which is 0.1 gray per second, which is delivered in minute. You can see that it's really another range, completely different. Then uh, this plot here uh, to, to the right shows exactly what uh, uh, is the advantage of flash radiotherapy. Here on the y-axis there is the probability and on the x-axis there is the dose. Now if you see the green curve, first of all the, the solid line is conventional radiotherapy whereas the dashed line is the flash radiotherapy. If you see this green curve, you can see that as far as tumor control there is no difference between these two modalities. So the cancer cells are killed exactly in the same way with ultra high dose rates and with conventional uh, beams. But if you see the red curve, which is the normal tissue complication, you can see that there is a quite significant difference. So for a certain dose, uh, the normal tissue uh, complication uh, that you can see here is higher uh, with the conventional radiotherapy than with, with the flash radiotherapy. So basically in this uh, situation what happens is that, and this is the third curve, the blue curve, the tumor control without normal tissue complication is better with flash uh, therapy than with conventional radiotherapy. This results in the widen of the therapeutic window. So that's why here we are talking about something which has the potential to be a paradigm change. Uh, so that's really interesting. And uh, basically the results uh, about the flash radiotherapy in the last few years uh, are really remarkable because the first paper I said it's 2015 and in 2018 there was already the first treatment of a patient with flash therapy which was done at SHUV, so the University Hospital in Lausanne. And as you can see here the treatment was successful because after three weeks there is a clear uh, reduction of uh, the tumor. This was a surface tumor and after five months the reduction Reduction is even much more visible. So that's uh, uh, interesting, definitely. This thing uh, of, uh, so this flash therapy was noticed, of course, by uh, the scientific community and in particular by the ASTRO. The ASTRO is the, the, the famous society, American Society for Radiation Oncologists. And these plots are quite interesting because uh, uh, these are the report, the answers to the polls which uh, were held in 2018 and 2019 at the Astro uh, members, uh, the Astro conferences. So the Astro members were asked what is the one big discovery that needs to be translated into the clinic right now. And as you can see in 2018, you have lots of interesting answers 
like uh, treatment, so like immunotherapy, treatment of oligometastasis, uh, stereotactic uh, body radiation therapy, hypofractionation in the liquid biopsies. In 2019, there was actually the, the flash radiotherapy, which is the first, so it's really something that the scientific community would like to translate into the clinic quickly as soon as possible. So what's the issue with that? Here, uh, this plot shows uh, the ion collection efficiency as a function of the dose per pulse. And uh, this is a study done by Peterson et al. in 2017. This, of course, is for an ionization chamber. In particular, this is a Marcus chamber, which is uh, a, a standard. Uh, it's the gold standard in radiotherapy. And you can see here that up to 0 0.1 uh, here, uh, 0 0.1 gray per second, the ion collection efficiency of these ionization ch chambers is basically 100%. Uh, but then, uh, after that, there is actually a reduction of the ion collection efficiency. And in the flush regime, so starting from one gray per pulse, here we are talking about flush uh, therapy with pulsed beam, uh, the ionization chambers uh, fail. And so uh, there is actually, there are two options. So one is to develop algorithms which take into account for these recombination effects. And we have seen, for example, yesterday in the talk by uh, Giada Petringa that uh, this is already done and this is one thing. Then the other thing is actually to develop new solutions to this issue. And so let's go to this second point, which is uh, the development of new detector for flash at the University of Bern. And uh, the principle here is very uh, basic. We have a scintillator, a miniaturized scintillator here on the top of uh, 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 an optical fiber. And then, of course, when the beam interacts with the scintillator, there is a light emission which is driven into the optical fiber and then goes to data acquisition system which is uh, a fast PMT or a photodiode, uh, then connected to a photon counter system, which can be an electrometer or a multi-channel scaler. And then finally, the laptop for data analysis. Uh, this uh, use of scintillator for uh, uh, medical application is uh, quite widespread. We have seen also uh, the poster today on, uh, by the group of Heidelberg on the, on the scintillators for, uh, for, uh, for flash. For, uh, for medical applications. Uh, but uh, yeah, in this case, uh, we have a, a, this miniaturized scintillator uh, on, the, on the tip of the optical fiber. And uh, uh, this project is uh, a young investigator project of which I am the, the PI, which was funded by the Bern Center for Precision Medicine. And we did the first test at the Bern Cyclotron, which is uh, at the Bern University Hospital in Sespital. So as far as the scintillators, we are using polystyrene scintillators, uh, but also uh, yttrium-doped barium fluoride and GAGG, which are much more radi radiation resistant than the, the polystyrene in very small size, as I said. Here it's a 0 0.5 times 0 0.5 times two cubic millimeter scintillator. Then basically we use two setup. One is a PMT connected to an electrometer and the other setup is a, a fast avalanche photodiode uh, connected to a, a multi-channel scaler. Now the bottleneck of uh, the time resolution of this system in this case is given by the multi-channel scaler or in general by the, the, the photon counter which is down to 100 nanoseconds, which for medical application is already quite uh, uh, good. So this is the experimental setup. Uh, this is the scintillator uh, coupled uh, with the optical fiber. You can see here there is the beam extraction window and then the optical fiber with the scintillator. And then the optical fiber goes, is drawn outside the bunker and goes to another lab. Uh, in particular here there is a dark box which, with, the, with the photo detector inside. Now, which are the advantages? So here we have a spatial resolution of millimeter, of the order of millimeter, a time resolution down to 100 nanosecond, and then basically no radiation damage to the photo detector and the electronics. That's the, 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 basically the advantage of the optical fiber. So this is the burn medical cyclone where we performed the first tests. And this is an IBA 1818 MEV cyclone. 1818 because it, 
it features two ion sources, two proton sources, and in total it has eight exit ports. Now these exit ports, six of these exit ports are connected to water enriched target, enriched with uh, oxygen it in. So basically they are used for the production, for the production of uh, the fluorine it in, uh, the oxyglucose. Uh, for uh, nuclear medicine application, and there are two exit ports which are used for research. In particular, there is this one, which is uh, the, the, the beam line, which goes to, to another bunker here with independent access to the experimental area. And here it's where we perform our experiment. These are two pictures of uh, the cyclotron with the beam line, which then goes to the bunker and then to, to, the, other, to the other bunker, and uh, here it's... Uh, uh, the second bunker. Now, one of uh, the advantages here that we realized, let's say, by, by chance, is that uh, uh, when we keep actually very low the, the ion source, because this uh, cyclone is taught for uh, very high currents so for production, but when we keep it low, basically we are in the range of, uh, of flash at 18 MeV, which of course it's not a medical energy, but uh, still it's good for testing uh, new detector and instrumentation. This is the system for independent dosimetry that we are using, so it's uh, based on, on a Faraday cap measurement. So there is first a shaping ring, which is this green, uh, uh, green shaping ring here, oh, the pointer, okay. And then uh, the, the, the proton beam is, is, is shaped and interacts with the second ring, which is a damp ring. And uh, then there is also a bias ring, which is uh, placed at a negative voltage in order to push back the secondary electrons and to have the, the Faraday cap uh, uh, measurement. Then uh, there is the extraction window and uh, finally the scintillator with uh, uh, the optical fiber, which goes to the data acquisition system to the other bunker. This is also another picture, and uh, here we have uh, the extraction window and the scintillator um, with, uh, with the optical fiber. We verified also the dose rate with radiochromic film dosimetry and also the flatness of the beam, which as you can see here, it's, uh, it's quite uh, good. It's less than 1%, so we were happy with uh, this uh, dosimetry. And then, as far as the beam diagnostics, we have also uh, this uh, system, which is also based on scintillation optical fiber. So it's not a small scintillator like the one that we are testing, but it's uh, a fiber, which is a scintillating fiber. And basically, there are two fibers. One moves uh, horizontally, the other one vertically. And by those, we can measure the beam profiles. And this system is commercialized by DPACE, which is a Canadian company, and was developed by our group at University of Bern. Then let's go to the results with proton first and then with electron beams. And so basically we were looked, we wanted to, uh, to, to study two uh, features. So one is the linearity and the other one is the beam monitoring. So as far as the linearity, this plot of the left of this slide shows the, the output of our system. So the current measured with the PMT as a function of the dose rate. And you can see that the linearity is quite good up to 800 gray per second. So really in the flash regime. Then the second plot on the, on the right here shows the beam monitoring. So basically uh, we have the counts with the time beam, uh, time beam of uh, 50 microsecond uh, for a time window of 1.5 second. And basically in this plot we had for the first 300 milliseconds no beam. Then uh, we deliver, so we delivered the beam by pu putting up uh, the pop-up probe or uh, the beam stopper which is placed at the center of the cyclone and then we had the beam on for the, for the other, for the other uh, 500, actually one second. Then uh, I anticipated also at the beginning of uh, this uh, talk that uh, I also would like to, to, to say something about our tests uh, at uh, the clear facilities with the VHE. Uh, VHE are very high energy electrons which are promising also for uh, medical applications uh, as an alternative to, to, to protons and then they have also the advantage that they can be combined with, with flash. So uh, I don't say uh, too much about the, f the clear facility because we had uh, lots of interesting talks in, the, in, the, in these days. 
Uh, but what we did, we worked at 180 MeV and one hertz of repetition rate. Then here you can see there is the ICT, the transformer, and then uh, the, uh, the belt with radiochromic film as well, because we measured also with radiochromic film, and the scintillator with the optical fiber. And then at the very end, there is the YAG screen in order to have also uh, results on uh, the, um, the, beam, uh, of the beam shape uh, and the beam profiles. So these are the results. Uh, also, as far as the linearity, uh, we measured the, the linearity with the charge per bunch. And so this is charge per bunch up to 500 picocoulomb. This we have to transform still in those. Uh, data analysis is in progress. But uh, from a very first uh, uh, rough estimation, this 500, um, uh, 500 picocoulomb, this correspond to roughly 20, 20 gray per, per pulse, which is, of course, a quite high dose for medical application. And also here, uh, the detector so shows a linear behavior. Then also what we did, we, we moved the optical, uh, the optical fiber to the left and then up and down, left, right, and up and down. And so we measured the beam profiles at steps of uh, uh, 500, 500 micrometer. And also we had uh, quite, uh, quite good results here to the right. And so finally, uh, I'll say, so the conclusion to summarize what we did, uh, we saw that flash radiotherapy, it's actually very promising. I would say it's a potential breakthrough uh, in cancer therapy, but this potential is really important because of course, uh, this has to be uh, verified. Uh, but the flash clinical translation is uh, indeed uh, challenging. So um, what we are doing at the University of Bern, we are developing new dosimeter for flash radiotherapy. And uh, uh, this dosimeter feature uh, millimeter uh, spatial resolution and uh, time resolution down to 100 nanosecond. Next step of this project will involve the study of scintillator with high radiation resistance, so in particular this GAGG and uh, barium fluoride. Uh, and others. Uh, for example, this zinc oxide actually are really interesting as well. And uh, also, finally, we are interested in studying the, the energy dependence of, uh, of the scintillator. Then finally, uh, it's uh, this part of the acknowledgement, which is uh, really important because, of course, all this project is uh, possible because of uh, uh, the funding of the Bern Center for Precision Medicine and of the Swiss National Science uh, Foundation, and then also uh, the collaboration with the engineers for, from the Laboratory for a High Energy Physics of the University of Bern, of uh, Swan Isotope Nage, which is the company which uh, produces the radioisotope at Tinze Spital and also with the Claire facility. And then finally, there is a, a, a Dominic Vermelinger, who is a, a bachelor student at the University of Bern, who is working a lot on this project and is uh, helping. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you for the nice presentation. And it's time for questions and comments, please. Okay. Hi, thank you. That's a nice, interesting uh, procedure. I'm curious. So, is the ob your objective is to build a fiber array in two dimensions in order to establish the dose in a, as a function of x and y? Yes, this, as, a, this, as a proton beam scans across the, the tumor projection. Yeah, this could be indeed an interesting application. So, which is the real time beam monitoring for flash. But then also um, one uh, system, one single scintillator couplet to the optical fiber could be interesting for uh, application like in vivo dosimetry. That's also something which is uh, interesting to, to study. In particular for uh, uh, this flash uh, therapy, it's not yet known uh, the, the, the mechanism behind the flash effect, so it's important to know the dose locally. And so that, that's one thing, but yes, definitely, the real-time beam monitoring, it's, uh, it's uh, as you said, like a grid, that could be a really interesting uh, application, uh, future application of this project. And, and a follow-up, so in, in all cases, are you, you would be measuring the, you say dosimetry, you're referring to the beam, not at the isocenter, but at the exit from the nozzle. So it's high energy and not, if it's a proton, not at the bright peak region where in a phantom. 
Y yes, so uh, indeed. So at the moment, uh, the beam it's uh, the, the dosimeter is exposed directly to the beam, to the high energy beam. But then uh, the idea is to use also this system, for example, inside the water phantom, as you say, and uh, reconstruct the percentage depth dose curve also close to the Bragg peak for protons or to uh, the, the depth uh, dose for, for other radiation types. Yeah, thanks. Okay, other questions? Yes, please. Yeah, so, uh, one more time, regarding the size of the detector, it looks like a really small, half by half millimeter times two millimeter. I guess the beam size is rather larger than the detector. The beam size is uh, much larger than the detector. So in case of protons, it's, it's really much larger because it's a centimeter. In case of the beam at clear, uh, it's also larger, but it's of the order of a millimeter. So yes, the, the beam in, goes to all the scintillators. Yeah, and uh, one more question uh, regarding the uh, therapy window. Like, uh, which particles exactly, exactly are we talking about? And uh, how much is the difference in uh, beam intensity for flash effect and for normal therapy? Yes, so first the second one, so the difference in beam intensity is what I uh, shown also before in this slide. So basically it's 40 gray per second compared to 0 0.1 gray per second of the conventional radiotherapy. So it's, uh, it's a difference of uh, order of magnitude, so of two order of magnitude in intensity. And then, uh, at the moment, uh, uh, the, so the experiments, preclinical experiments, show this flash effect uh, with um, electrons, with protons, uh, and uh, I know there is some things with photons, however, it's, it's difficult to have photons of such high dose rates. And carbon ions, basically, that's mm -hmm. another important. Could you please convert uh, it into a number of particles per second? Uh, no, <laughs> like this, no, but uh, so particle per second, let me, I don't want to say something wrong, but it should be something of the order of 10 to the power 11 particle per square centimeter per second. Um, do you need to have a detector in front or behind the patient if you're using protons? Uh, I have no feeling if uh, the protons will make it through the uh, uh, tissue. So is it something reasonable to put the detectors behind? Well, it depends on the application because, for example, thinking of the quality assurance for, uh, for radiotherapy, so what you have, you have a water phantom, so, and then the, the dosimeter uh, the idea is to measure the, the percentage depth dose curve. So uh, you want to measure in all the positions, but still in the, in the water phantom, not actually behind that. So, yeah. If there is no question, just thanks again to the speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, sorry. I, I wanted to, to make a comment here. Just here, over in the edge. Oh, I see. I'm, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, the ability of an ionization chamber to stay in the linear range increases with the voltage squared and the gap distance, one over the gap distance to the fourth order. So by increasing the voltage and lowering the gap, you could increase the ability of the ionization chamber by I would say a factor of 100 or more compared to the example you showed at one of the first slides. So I think ionization chambers should also be able to operate in the flash regime. Uh, that's definitely an interesting um, comment. Actually, uh, I, I understand your point and uh, basically, yes, I agree with what you say. Uh, however, what I think is that um, um, here, with this flash therapy, uh, the issue is that they, so clinicians cannot use directly the Marcus chambers as they are for the conventional radiotherapy. 
but yes, so for uh, research application, this is definitely something very interesting and to think about it. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's, uh, let me invite the uh, third speaker, Federico Roncalo. Federico Roncalo is working in the beam instrumentation group of the system department at CERN. He is leading the PM section, which is responsible for most of the transverse profile monitors at CERN and many in intensity position and profile monitors for the slow extra extraction transport, uh, uh, transport lines from the photon synchrotron PS, uh, proton synchrotron PS and super proton synchrotron SPS to the fixed target experimental facilities. Okay, please start. So thanks for the introduction. Uh, good afternoon to everybody and thanks to organizers who gave us the opportunity to show uh, a review of the fast pill monitors uh, studies that are ongoing and planned for the SPS fixed target beam. The SPS, as you know, is not only uh, the last of the LAC injectors, but uh, uh, it is, uh, um, maybe, can I ask you to put the time? Oh, 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 sorry. I know where I am, thanks. Uh, so it's not only the, um, the last uh, of the LAC injectors, but it also provides uh, 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 beams uh, to the North Area fixed target experiments. In fact, the beams, the proton beam is accelerated uh, at 400 GV and then uh, extracted uh, via slow extraction process uh, uh, to, the, to the experimental areas. This consists on uh, uh, disabling the RF and uh, so the beam, which is uh, ideally fully debunched, uh, is transferred there in a time which ranges, uh, which is now about five seconds and uh, can be reduced uh, uh, in the future in other configurations. Uh, so we know that what is called the spill quality of this extraction is affected at the macro and microstructure uh, level by different effects, uh, uh, ranging from hysteresis and uh, uh, repose in the power supplies or RF uh, spikes in the RF uh, system of the ring. Uh, indeed, uh, if the uh, spill structure uh, it is the one which is indicated here in yellow, so ideally a rectangle of a uniform uh, beam intensity during the spill. Uh, in reality, it is not, and uh, you, saw exa you see example of the measurements. So on one side, uh, uh, also considering the, the key parameters uh, that were asked to measure in, uh, in time domain, uh, intensity, and uh, uh, frequency range that you see in the table. Uh, monitoring uh, is, uh, uh, if on one side it is essential monitoring the spill quality for the success of the physics, uh, it is also challenging uh, given that we have to go from a few nanoampere to few uh, microampere of beam intensity in these uh, uh, one to five seconds uh, periods. And then we are uh, asked to investigate uh, 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 harmonics that go from a uh, few hertz to several gigahertz. At the moment, in the, trans in the first 200 meters of the transfer line, uh, uh, after the SPS extraction, we have three types of monitors. The first one is based on secondary emission. So the particles, the protons, they uh, pass through uh, a very thin uh, aluminum foil, generate secondary electrons, and counting uh, the number of secondary electrons, we try to reconstruct the, um, uh, the spill uh, structure. This is uh, um, a very robust system and uh, it is uh, uh, operationally used, in fact, uh, as a fit forward uh, and it was uh, uh, used in the past also as an online feedback for compensating 50 and 100 hertz repos in the power supplies of the equipment uh, for the extraction. Um, in short, the data acquisition system uh, is based on an amplifier in the tunnel with about 10 megahertz bandwidth, and then there are long cables uh, going to a low-pass filter, which at the moment we have to keep uh, to suppress uh, noise, and then uh, there is a digitization at uh, uh, 200 kilo sample per second. Uh, the signal to noise, uh, also starting from the fact that secondary emission yield, it is rather low, uh, this energy for this material is about 5%, per 4%, uh, we suffer of noise, uh, even after this one kilohertz uh, uh, filtering. And uh, there were in the recent uh, uh, 
activities, uh, quite some investigation to try to understand the source of noise without much success for the moment and uh, uh, for which we suspect there is a trouble in, uh, in this system, particular system which is uh, also aged and uh, during the next winter stop uh, there will be some intervention uh, to refurbish the vacuum parts and you see here the, some uh, uh, noise and signal figures uh, on the examples. So there will be more later in the presentation. Then we have two uh, diamond uh, bill loss monitors. So I will go uh, rather quickly because most of you have seen the very interesting uh, uh, presentation from Eva Calvo yesterday. Um, so they are based uh, on uh, um, on uh, crystals, um, on crystals, uh, uh, diamond crystals, um, and uh, uh, they are by definition uh, radar and, uh, and fast. Uh, they are extensively used, uh, as presented yesterday by Eva, in different locations at CERN and uh, also in other facilities. And uh, um, and two of them, so we have now installed in the in the transfer line from the SPS to the North Area. Uh, the data acquisition system also here in short, uh, uh, it is based on a, a, a wide band uh, uh, 40 dB amplifier in the tunnel and then a digitalization in the surface, also in this case after long cables, at 660 uh, mega sample per second. And uh, uh, as actually the three uh, detectors that I present today, the, it is all integrated in the uh, control system and in, in the data logging. And this is an example uh, of how these uh, diamond BLMs were uh, successfully used uh, this year to identify the presence of the residual uh, 200 megahertz uh, harmonic uh, in the spill and uh, the evolution of this harmonic uh, uh, along, uh, along the spill itself. And then the third uh, installed uh, system that we have, uh, it is more recent. We installed it this year, refurbishing an old installation. And so it is based on the uh, uh, monitoring and counting the uh, optical transition radiation generated by the beam passing through a very thin uh, metallic foil, a titanium, titanium foil, uh, a screen. So it is, uh, this is a method commonly used, uh, most of you know, uh, for a beam imaging. In this case, uh, we put, as you see, uh, a photomultiplier about one meter away from the uh, beam pipe, from the, from the beam axis. And uh, we count, uh, we count the, the optical transition radiation. And from uh, the beginning, this uh, works uh, uh, even uh, when, in fact, the screen is out, which is an uh, uh, indication of the fact that with this PMT, even one meter away, we are sensitive to beam losses. Uh, the data acquisition system in this case is based uh, with a um, fast uh, PMT, a wide band amplifier. Um, up to 200 and, and 300 megahertz amplifier. This is the present uh, installation. And also in this case, after rather long cables, then uh, the signal is digitized, uh, um, is duplicated and digitized by fast digitizers, uh, which are presently set, one of them uh, at high, relatively high uh, rate, one megahertz to cover the whole spill, uh, again online, and the other one uh, at uh, higher speed, uh, our higher rate acquisition uh, and uh, with which we can uh, select chunks uh, of about 110 milliseconds along the spill. Uh, this will, so we acquire in parallel these two uh, signals and it is also integrated in the control system and can be logged. Here you see examples of the uh, no signal noise figures. Uh, so, uh, as expected, uh, when there is no beam, uh, even with the high voltage on, uh, we have uh, uh, very low noise, as you see on the top plot. And uh, um, uh, with the risk, we have, uh, in fact, uh, uh, ve ve very roughly calculating the signal to noise via peak to peak uh, calculations. Uh, we, uh, we come up with a similar noise uh, uh, figure as for the second emission detector, but in this case, we don't have. Uh, um, uh, any low pass filter which makes uh, uh, the system much more interesting in this sense. Uh, and you see an example on uh, here of one of the um, uh, harmonics of interest which is the revolution frequency uh, of the SPS that we clearly uh, measure without 
uh, with a very good signal to noise. And this year, you have another example, again, similar to the Diamond BLMs. We could identify uh, uh, the presence of the uh, 200 megahertz harmonic, which is residual from the RF capture in the ring, uh, and which is unwanted. In fact, the, the operation wants to suppress it, and its evolution, which is the red curve here, so it is uh, the evolution, the relative evolution of the of this harmonic along uh, uh, the spill. So you have, uh, you see, you have uh, a very high uh, 200 megahertz peak uh, in uh, uh, at the beginning of the spill, and then a rather constant along. Um, then uh, uh, now I have a few uh, comparison between this uh, uh, PMT bay OTR PMT based detector and the secondary emission monitor. Uh, so by design, uh, uh, I've uh, discussed the fact, I presented the fact that, that they acquire different uh, acquisition rates. But when uh, we uh, bin uh, the time signal in the, in the same time intervals for comparison at first, like in this case on the left, uh, 20 milliseconds, and on the right, uh, 1 millisecond, then the agreement is uh, really uh, very good. Um, as uh, uh, also considering so that there are two different uh, uh, methods uh, 30, sitting 30 meters uh, apart from each other with different uh, data acquisition systems, but uh, in fact then the, the, the information they contain um, uh, or about the spill quality is clearly uh, the same as you see here and as you see in this other example where when we zoom, uh, in, in this case uh, I kept the secondary emission monitor at its uh, frequency uh, of acquisition of 50 kilohertz, and then I, I bind uh, the OTR PMT signal at the same uh, binning, so the 20 microsecond, uh, the equivalent of 50 kilohertz. And you see how well, uh, in fact, the envelope of the signal also when you uh, do the zoom, uh, it is uh, agreeing. Uh, and then uh, we can appreciate here that, as expected, the presence of the low uh, frequency uh, or the low pass filter for the for the same detector, uh, it is uh, uh, it is a limitation. Whereas the, the, the PMT is able to f to follow very nicely the fast intensity variation that again are unwanted and operation uh, tries to suppress. Um, now I have really have. Uh, a few uh, words about uh, future options and studies that we have uh, on the table at the moment ongoing. So the first one uh, I only kept in a, in a background slide, and uh, we can discuss later, or uh, you can look at the slide if you want. Uh, it is uh, about uh, gas, uh, the, the possibility to use uh, uh, gas scintillation, which is a technique that, in fact, it is operational in the other facility at CERN where we have uh, fixed target experiments or slow extraction in the PS at 24 GV. Uh, and we are investigating uh, if uh, uh, this is an option also uh, to be implemented if needed uh, uh, in, the, in the SPS. And then uh, the second uh, uh, option that uh, for sure we will uh, investigate is uh, uh, resurrect uh, this uh, existing installation actually, which consists of a, a Cherenkov base detector, so a, a quartz. Uh, um, here there is a cartoon. Uh, so a quartz bar uh, can be inserted uh, uh, partially or totally into the beam, and then the, Cherenkov, the, light, uh, the radiation, the light generated by Cherenkov effect, is collected also on a, on a photodetector, a PMT in this case. This is a detector that actually it was extensively used a few years ago in the context of the studies uh, about the crystal assisted slow extraction, which is now uh, successfully working at the SPS, and then it was modified. Uh, for testing this technique in the TT20 line, so in our transfer line, as a fast spill detector. And the plan is, uh, since at the moment it's a bit orphan, is to resurrect this system and uh, study the ultimate bandwidth and propose uh, uh, standard data acquisition system that for the moment uh, are not implemented. And this will be part of the work actually of a postdoc that uh, we start with us uh, uh, in a few weeks. Um, and uh, this is instead uh, a very recent idea that came out also for, for the thanks again to the, to, for the organizers because brainstorming a bit with our colleagues uh, with, in our team about possible solutions then uh, this uh, could be a possibility that for the moment uh, only this uh, slide exists and consists on adapting uh, uh, and profiting of the knowledge that uh, uh, is, um, our colleagues uh, uh, gained in the last uh, in the recent years about uh, um, time peaks uh, based uh, um, 
ionization monitors, transverse profile uh, ionization monitors. Uh, in this case, uh, potentially uh, adding, modifying the system uh, uh, with uh, uh, focusing electrons and use to count uh, the ionized uh, electrons and the rec reconstructed information about uh, the, um, the spill uh, structure. Now I have a few tables which uh, uh, I can uh, flash uh, rather quickly. It is uh, most of these I already mentioned. So in this, uh, uh, so here I summarize uh, for reference uh, uh, the different uh, 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 the key parameters of the different implementations that uh, that I uh, described the different methods. I just want to uh, again stress the fact that with the present implementation, the three detectors here they uh, feature uh, rather long uh, uh, copper cables for the signal transport, which limits the ultimate bandwidth. So we are uh, looking, and also there is a, 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 back, uh, a backup slide about uh, our investigation of uh, plans to study digitization in the tunnel and uh, uh, optical uh, signal transmission, so to improve uh, uh, the overall bandwidth. And uh, in this table, uh, uh, I summarize a bit the, the present limitation and especially what uh, we believe it can be in the short term uh, addressed, uh, which goes from refurbishing uh, the in vacuum uh, detectors of the same that I already mentioned to more uh, um, beam based studies and, uh, for example, for uh, uh, the PMT detector to. Uh, move or duplicate the signal in order to have a PMT which is further away from beam losses and be dominated by the optical radiation, uh, optical transition radiation, which is uh, what in fact we want by design from this detector. Uh, and the rest also I already mentioned, so I can give to my uh, last slide uh, that also it is a summary of uh, assessment uh, I already uh, mentioned. Um, so uh, what I uh, wanted to stress here, and then I leave this uh, and so that I leave time for questions, uh, is that, uh, um, again, going to uh, more than one gigahertz uh, uh, range uh, uh, requires the, the data acquisition system upgrades and possibly uh, the, the, the implementation of different techniques. Um, and that, uh, this is especially for us at CERN, at a certain point, depending on uh, resources and, uh, and uh, also result of brainstormings and reviews, uh, likely at a certain point we will have to take strategic decisions uh, for uh, uh, deciding uh, which and how uh, of these techniques, uh, which technique to pursue and how we will do it, and uh, to optimize, uh, uh, for example, the efforts in developing data acquisition systems that can be common to different types of detectors. So, thanks a lot, and I hope it was clear enough. Thank you very much for your comprehensive uh, Presentation, thank you. Yeah. Now we are open for the question and comments. All clear. <laughs> no. No. Okay. <laughs> It was so complete. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thanks again to the speaker. Okay, let's invite the last speaker at Alexandra Maria. Alexandra Maria studied me mechanical engineering in Toulouse, France, where he works in the collaboration with NASA to design a part of SuperCam, an instrument for the new Mars rover. He joined CERN in 2016 and started a PhD course in 2019. He will talk about carbon nanotubes and their potential application in wire scanners. Please. Uh, yeah, good afternoon, everybody, and thanks for this introduction. So, as you already said, my talk uh, of today is about the carbon nanotubes and their potential application for the beam instrumentation, and more specifically for the wire scanners. Uh, I just want to, to, to start with a quick introduction to well understand what our needs and uh, our interest in a new, um, in a new um, 
and in, and in a new material for our uh, instrumentation. Then I will briefly explain what are the carbon, uh, the carbon nanotubes. And finally, I, I want to show you some very prelim uh, preliminary results about our, our experiment in iron mat. So first of all, as you probably know, at CERN, we are always pushing to improve the brightness and the luminosity of the beams. And the intensity as well as the energy is already uh, very high, but it will drastically increase in the future. Whereas the beam size will decrease, and this will lead to extreme beam densities. And the uh, instrumentation of this kind of uh, beams with intercepting uh, devices is a real challenge. My work was mostly focused on the wire scanner, which is uh, an instrument widely used uh, at CERN, um, which um, allows the, the measurement of the beam profile, the transfer beam profile of the beam. Uh, it moves uh, very thin wires. At CERN, we use a carbon fiber of 34 microns, uh, which crosses the beam. The position of the, the, position of the wire uh, is combined with the signal of the secondary particle shower produced by the beam wire interaction, and doing that, we can reconstruct the profile of the beam. The problem is with our, this, with this instrument, we are currently limited with its use. Thanks. Um, so we already observed in the SPS, in certain conditions with slow linear wire scanners, a degradation of the wires with a sublimation of 80% of the diameter, remaining only seven microns of material in the middle. So this is a bit, this is an issue. So to solve this issue, we developed a new generation of fast wire scanners, which is already deployed in the accelerator chain, so the booster, PS, and the SPS. And this new instrument allows scans with speed up to 20 meters per second which is the fastest as we can find uh, around the world. But the problem is, if we want to keep a sufficient resolution of three point per sigma, we can see that for the SPS and the LHC, with small beam size, we need to reduce the speed at four and 0.8 meter per second. And currently in the LHC, we are not able to scan a full beam, uh, a full intensity beam, and we are limited to eight bunches and against 2,000 Android possible. So this is frustrating. So a solution would be to, as the mechanics and the electronics have already been uh, modified, a solution would be to replace the current carbon fibers with a new material uh, which would meet some very high specifications, in particularly in terms of mechanical and thermal properties, with a very high strength to for the handling uh, during the installation, of course, but also to reduce the deflections during the scan. Uh, it also needs to have a low density to reduce the number of interaction during the scan. A high conductivity to evacuate more efficiently the, um, the heat. And of course, it has to be radioactive and ultra high vacuum environment compatible. And this material could be found in the quality of the carbon nanotubes. So the CNT are an allotropic form of carbon, like graphite or diamond, but they are formed by a single or several sheets of graphene rolled in a specific direction, and from this direction depend the, uh, the properties of the CNT. They have diameters around some nanometers, and they have lengths which can reach some micrometers. Some records talk about millimeters, but that's not very common. So here you have each. The one of the first uh, one of the first pictures from the uh, of different uh, kind of CNT with different number of walls uh, taken with a transmission electron microscope. So the mechanical and the thermal properties, or I mean all the properties of this type of material, so the CNT, are very very impressive. So the density is a function of the walls, uh, of the number of walls and their diameters. So it means that managing, uh, we can manage the density as we want uh, with, the, uh, with a control of the manufacturing process. And this density could reach down a density of 0.02 gram per cube centimeters. 
if we are comparing with the carbon fibers or the stainless steel, it's much lower, so it's better for us. About the mechanical and the thermal properties, uh, it's everything is much above what we can find with traditional uh, or more common uh, materials. So we are talking about terapascal for the modulus against gigapascal and gigapascal for the strength, so which is the maximal stress we can apply, uh, the maximal load we can apply before the, the, the rupture of the, of, the, um, of the samples. We are talking about gigapascal, which is something we cannot find in any other material. The thermal properties are also much higher than for the, the other material. So basically what we can say is all the properties are the, are the best in all the domains. So it makes of it uh, an ideal candidate for our applications. But because of the nanoscale, uh, we can, first, we cannot handle them, we cannot manipulate them, and so far we don't have the technology to fix a single tube on our forks, on our instrument. And that's why we decided to focus our research on their microscopic assembly, assembly in a yarn. So the carbon nanotube yarns, or wires, uh, is a structure in four different scales. So first, we have the CNT, the carbon nanotubes, uh, with a size of such nanometers, and these nanotubes uh, agglomerate to form bundles, and these bundles entangle to form fibers, and finally these fibers, or layers, we can spin them, and we, obtain, we can obtain the final yarn of 10, 20, 30, even 100 micron. But contrary to the CNT, which are of strong covalent bond between carbon atoms, all the sub-assemblies, so between bundles and between fib uh, fibers, every, uh, all these sub-assemblies are, are bonded with only weak van der Waal forces. And this leads to a large degradation of the properties. So that's another issue. A lot of issue. Really. But, but some studies uh, already showed that if we irradiate, if we irradiate uh, this kind of wires with uh, gamma rays in certain conditions, we could improve the properties uh, mechanical properties by creating uh, constrictive defects and covalent bonds between bundles and between tubes. But the question is, is that also true for our condition? I mean, with a beam of a proton beam, with an energy of 440 JeV, a very small beam size of 0.25 millimeters, and a very, very high intensity. Uh, and that's the purpose of uh, the, experiment, the experiment we developed. So we irradiated different samples uh, to analyze the behavior after irradiation. So we installed 30 CNT yarns on a PCB frame uh, and two carbon fibers of 7 and 34 microns. So the carbon fibers are the one we currently use in the, in the wire scanners. And uh, we, so we installed them on a PCB frame connected to a same grid. And the CNT yarns uh, have a composition of 90% of carbon and 10% of ion. And that's important because, so the 10% of ion come from the residual uh, catalytic particles from the manufacturing process. So we had two different batches, so a thin uh, batch of 11 micron in uh, average, and a thick yarns, with, uh, a thick batch with 24 micron. But the, most, the, the real challenge with this experiment was the, to ensure the alignment of a beam of 0.25 millimeters and a sample of 11 micron without touching anything. Because once we move the grid, we don't touch. Uh, so we irradiate one by one. So what we did, uh, we installed a BTV screen on, directly on the grid and a BTV camera on the top of the tank. And we make a calibration of the position of the position of each wires and the center of the screen with the stepper motor of the same grid. In the tunnel, the alignment was ensured by the comparison between the images of our of our uh, yep, screen and 
the images of uh, BTV of reference, which was locati located a meter upstream. Uh, and the, the, reference, the BTV of reference is the one we used for all the uh, Ironmat experiment line. Before starting the test, we performed some FUCA simulations to get the deposited energy uh, in our yarns for, the both for both diameters and considering the 10% uh, of ion in mass, in, in weights. Right? We took these results and we implemented them in a thermal code. And what we observed that, well, in the end, there is no very high difference between the two maximal temperature reached by the wire at the end of the, um, of the test. But the temperature of 1,488 uh, Kelvin, even if it's well below uh, the sublimation temperature of carbon, it's above the transient temperature of ion. So we expect a modification of the structure. The first characteristic we measured was the secondary electron emission. So here is the signal for each sample with different number of pulses. And we normalized it by the, in the real intensity measured by the BCT in the line and by the position, thanks to the image of the BTV of reference. This normalization is very important because our samples is much smaller than the beam size. And what we observe about the secondary electron emission is despite the increase of the number of pulses, so the cumulated intensity crossing the wires, we don't see any obvious variation of this signal. So as the secondary electron emission is a surface effect, we expect no modification of the surface, at least not something very important. <laughs> but surprise. When we took the sample from after the test, we observed a very a major deformation where the wire, where the beam uh, impacted the, the wire. And this deformation has the shape of a Gaussian profile with a sigma equal to half, nearly equal to half of the beam size. So this is interesting. So we performed Raman spectroscopy on two different sites, on the pri pristine uh, on a pristine uh, area and in the middle of this deformation. And the decrease of the ID on IG ratio indicates that there is a decrease of the number of defects. That's something surprising. So the wire get cleaner, got cleaner after the tests. But what did produce this uh, deformation? We, we never uh, observed that. An idea, but we are not sure at all, is with the increase of the temperature, the iron just melt and traveled along the bundles uh, driven by, driven by the, the temperature gradient toward the cooler, uh, the cooler uh, temperature. And there is an agglomeration of these different liquid or different state of iron creating bigger cluster and pushing and putting under pressure the different fibers that broke and create this deformation. But that's something we need to investigate uh, more deeply with other samples. Finally, and because that was the purpose of uh, our test, uh, we tested them in tension. And what we observed is very clear. So we have a large decrease of the properties uh, yeah, spe uh, specifically in the, for the specific strength and the strength of failure uh, after I reditioned uh, compared to before. And what is surprising is that with the thinner batch, um, even if the number of protons crossing the wire is higher, uh, is lower, sorry, the decrease of the property is much higher. So something needs to be investigated. Maybe the linear density have a, have, has a role, but we don't know exactly. So yeah, to summary everything, we really need to find uh, an alternative solution to replace uh, the carbon fiber currently used uh, in our wire scanners. Uh, today, material which are available on the market, which could fit with our needs, our requests uh, in terms of geometry are far from what we could have for the maximal potential of the CNT. Uh, the 
stencil tests are very clear, but they didn't, uh, they, they didn't meet our expectation. And that's why we, we need to, to keep working closely with the manufacturers uh, to, to find, uh, to converge their, um, to, to an ideal uh, material for our applications. Um, so we developed a, a very interesting experiment which could be used uh, in the future for, other ma for, for our material, for new tests, but also for a new generation of mm, low-density materials. Uh, and currently, we have some tests uh, ongoing uh, in the SPS, so we are still under investigation for, for all the results. So a lot more still needs to be done. <laughs> Thanks a lot. For Thank you for the interesting talk. And now the floor is open for the question and comments, please. Sorry, uh, thank you to all these people who helped me for this project. <laughs> yes. Hi, th uh, thanks for your interesting talk. What was the uh, strength in gigapascals on the wires before and after? So, so, sorry, what? What was the strength, the tensile strength in ah. gigapascals? Um, the t yeah. Oh, yeah. So here, has the, the cross section is not very regular and circular. and It varies because of the manufacturing process. Uh, when, we t when we perform the test, we talk about the specific strengths and not the strengths. But here we have uh, 2.0.3 uh, Newton per tech, so gram per kilometer. Against, uh, we have a 1.2 for a non irradiated for thin wires. But for the strengths, for the maximal strengths, I don't know. I, I just know that the load broke at 1.4 gram. Just for comparison, we, we apply 30 gram on our current carbon, carbon fibers during the installation of the wire scanners. So clearly, this, at least these samples, this kind of manufacturing process uh, is not good enough for our applications, or we need to find other solution, uh, particularly maybe some post-treatment uh, processing to remove the impurities and improve the, pro the mechanical properties. Yeah. So when the wire bulged out with the radiation, you, you suspected that was the uh, iron catalyst that caused the swelling? Is the density less then in the That's wire? That's our guess. That's because of the the iron. Some papers make some. There, there were some studies uh, about this kind of tests, but it was with laser, and they observed this deformation. And they and they also had a high uh, proportion of iron. So it seems to be this point. Uh, we made some other tests in the SPS with all the type of uh, CNT wires, and we didn't see that. And we, we guess, because the supplier didn't, didn't send all the data from the, from the material, but we guess that there were, it was more pure than what we can have here. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Other questions? Yes, please. Yeah, here. Yeah, thank you for this presentation. The way how you manipulate with all these tiny structures is really impressive. Uh, my question is regarding the Raman spectroscopy measurement. Uh, about the Raman? Yes. Uh, so um, did you measure uh, it uh, for not irradiated and irradiated uh, yarn uh, at the same point or at several points? How yeah. big is uh, homogeneity along the yarn and so on? Yeah, we took we took different samples, thin, thick, uh, and we swept all the yarns, so point by point, and 
honestly, there were no difference anywhere. So as it takes a lot of time, so we stopped at a point. But yeah, we, we made, I don't know, maybe 30. So the samples, so the samples were two centimeters long and we made 30, 30 measurements, so all around, and there is the, all the profile, all the spectra are almost the same, yeah. So the effect that was observed, it is really because of the irradiation, not uh, because of inhomogeneity? Probably there is, because we made other focus simulations about the impact of the radiation on the carbon, but the problem is we, we did it before implemented the 10% in mass in weight of iron. And we see that with only carbon, there were no, not uh, a lot impact of the radiation. But probably with uh, iron, it's different. Yeah. Thank you. Welcome. Other questions? I have one. In the case of free electron laser, the electron beam size can go down to the 20 micrometer or something, three, three, 30 micrometers, something like that. So what is the minimum size, what is the minimum thickness of this kind of carbon nanotube? Uh, for one tube or for the wire? Mm -hmm. for, Why? Uh, for the wire. For, wire uh, for the wire. I think that they, they're rich to have a wire of five micrometers? Five micrometers. Five micrometers. But they can, with this manufacturing process, so they can, they can spin uh, on a window to ag agglomerate different, uh, all these fibers, and then they shrink it with alcohol, and then they, they, um, they obtain uh, a kind of mat mm -hmm. of some nanometers of thickness. Mm -hmm. So that, yeah. We can decrease, and the density, so here we are around 1.4 gram per cube centimeters, but with the mat, they can decrease uh, up to 0.5, maybe more or less. <laughs> I see, thank you, thank you. Okay, let's thanks again to the speaker.